Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Nate Pearson, co-founder and CEO of Trainer Road. In this episode, Nate shares his experience building a bootstrap, profitable company over the last 10 years. We explore the fast-growing and increasingly competitive endurance tech category, and we talk about Trainer Road's adaptive training platform that uses machine learning to help cyclists get faster. Before today's episode, I wanted to share some updates to the Fit Insider platform. As you might know, in addition to this podcast, we send a weekly newsletter to help operators stay informed and make better decisions. We also launched an industry-specific jobs board filled with hundreds of openings at top companies, and we're actively investing in early-stage health and fitness startups. To see what's new or to get in touch, visit insider.fit.co. Hi, Nate. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation here today. And to kick things off for folks who maybe aren't familiar, can you tell us a little bit about Trainer Road and introduce yourself? Yeah, Trainer Road is a cycling training platform. So the goal of Trainer Road is to make cyclists faster. It's a subscription app. And what happens is people put their bikes, what's called a trainer, which is kind of like a treadmill for your bike. And then they sign up, they do a fitness assessment. And based on the results of that test, we give them structured workouts and training plans that adapt to their performance and follow their goals using AI. And then for me, my name is Nate Pearson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trainer Road. Yeah. And I think even with that, certainly both on this show and uh, just generally, we've seen a lot in the endurance tech or endurance category more recently, but you guys have been around for a little while, maybe a decade, decade plus. So can you you talk about how the company got started and, and how that evolved over time to where you are today? Yeah, I was taking uh, what are called CompuTrainer classes about mm, maybe 11, maybe even 12 years ago. And uh, these were special machines. I'd have to go to a studio and I was out of college and it cost $20 a class. And I couldn't afford to like, it was two things. The time to go there, do the workout and come back was too much, but I also couldn't afford $20 a workout. I was a triathlete at a time, want to do it three or four times a week. And it was just too expensive for me. So I thought, hey, I could write this software for myself. And the coach that was there, he made great workouts and had a lot of experience. And I had him come in too. And then once we started building it, we decided, hey, we could sell this to other people. And then we've been bootstrapped since then, uh, going for 10 years. And we have uh, like 94, 95 employees, something like that. And uh, I think we were one of the first in, outside of CompuTrainer, they were local. I think we're the first one to sell it online at like scale of the companies that are there. But of course, there's a, there's a lot more now today. Yeah, I definitely want to get into some of those other companies, but in terms of what, you know, a user would experience when they first start with Trainer Road and maybe getting on board or even coming to the platform, can you just describe, you mentioned, you know, helping cyclists get faster, but what does yes. that entail and, and what can I expect as somebody who's new to it? Yeah. So Trainer Road, we do a specific thing is we want to make people as fast as possible. And we focus just on that with structured intervals that line up to you know, in the workout to the week, to the month, to the season, to build you for a peak. Or if you just want to have general fitness, there's two different kinds of sides of trainer road for that. But that, that is what we try to do. And what, what happens with the product is you do the fitness assessment, which is kind of a, it's a stepped ramp test where you just keep going harder and harder until you can't do it anymore. And after that, we give you structured intervals. It's, it's mostly intervals because for the the regular person who, who's the, not the pro who can train 20 to 30 hours per week, a great way to get faster is to do structured interval training. And we have the standard kind of sweet spot build and specialty where you kind of sharpen it, but we also have polarized plans too for those who want to do that. And so what you would do is you'd sign up and as you work out on your indoor bike trainer, you would see the app and we'd count you through second by second and give you targets. And if you had a smart trainer, we would lock you in. Now, this is all stuff that is geared specifically for you. So basically, as long as you can pedal and you have the crit, you're going to be able to get through that workout. Now, if something were to happen in that workout where you couldn't finish or you didn't have enough time, uh, you didn't eat well that day, and we detect through our ML that you didn't do it as prescribed, we then send you a survey and adjust your training plan in order to do it. Because what happens with previously to this is I kind of, I like it, think of it like uh, lifting weights is if you're squatting 200 pounds and it crushes you, and then your training plan goes next week, you're doing 225. And that's what a lot of training plans are like is they're, they should be progressive. But when life happens, or if you skip a workout, they don't adapt automatically for you. And previously people would pay for coaches for this, but now we want to do it at scale with AI and just keep improving that AI to make sure that that people get the right workout at the right time. You also have an outdoor component. So you could do those workouts outdoors too, but 
Um, most people do it indoors and there's kind of a mix depending on the time of year and the hemisphere you're in. Yeah. Can you talk about how you think about that? Because I'm curious, obviously, whether it's cycling or triathlon, a huge component of that is, you know, setting up the indoor trainer and having a power meter and doing a lot more kind of personalized training plans. But on the flip side, you have a lot of folks who are also part of it is right riding outdoors and maybe using a bike computer and syncing some of that how do you think about appealing to that person who might be inside when they go outside staying with them and you know do you do you see that you lose folks when they transition from indoors to outdoors and, and just make sure that you kind of stay with them through that whole training life cycle yeah it really depends on the person and what their motivation and goals are but what we see a lot in the summer what happens is someone might do one to two structured workouts per week. And then on the weekends, do longer rides with their friends or maybe do a race. And those would replace some of the other workouts that we have in the system, but that's okay. And you just, they get assigned and the system adapts after that. But the, the real meat of it is you have to do those structured intervals during the, some kind of intervals. What we also see in our data is people will, they, they will stay like, we'll still have their Strava synced in. So we can still see what's coming in the data. And if you stop doing interval training indoor or outdoor, you can do them either way with trainer road your fitness usually falls off. Like you get in this habit of like, just kind of having fun in the summer, not just having fun, but being unstructured. And then the unstructured leads to the grades of performance, just like in the gym, right? If you just kind of go, I'm just going to lift what I want rather than following a structured plan, you get different outcomes. So that's, that's what happens that we see, but there's a lot of people too, who get way faster in the summer with the mix of indoor and outdoor, or they just do totally outdoor and our workouts will download to your Garmin or your Wahoo head unit. And you can actually do them outside too. And then the system will adapt based on that. Yeah, it's it's interesting seeing all the different inputs and how people are getting faster. Or maybe even you mentioned that those social rides playing into it. When you think about the the evolution of the platform and, and the product, you, you mentioned it a couple of times using AI and machine learning. This year, after I think testing it in, in for quite a while in, in a closed beta, you launched the adaptive training, even more personalized workouts and training plans. Can you talk about how that differs from, well, I guess one, what the product previously was and how users were interacting with it. And then two, how now the new adaptive training plans differ from what else is on the market? Yeah. So that's a good question. Previously, what happened is, so we, we look at all the science and coaches and other people at our company where we made our training plans that someone would follow. That would kind of be like the bell curve of of research where most people fit into like this ratio between FTP and VO2 max percentage, what they can hold. And there's kind of norms, right? And you build it for that. But what happens is two things. People fall outside of those norms, especially at different ages. And I think women are underrepresented in research too. But then also life happens where, you know, you had a sick kid and you miss a workout. So what we do is after you do the ramp test and the fitness assessment, as you work out, you actually progress through seven different energy systems and we decouple them. So you might be really good at VO2 max, but horrible at sustained threshold. And we will progress you differently through those systems. We see a lot too, where someone might be, they might have a big weight training background and they're really, they respond really well to anaerobic efforts, but that doesn't mean that they have any endurance, right? And then we want to decouple those and train those separately. And the cool thing about this is you don't have to do a test to get these different levels. Every workout is essentially a test with a response of how hard that was. So if, if I was coaching you personally, you would say, Hey, I did this VO two max workout. And that was, that was a very hard workout. I'm like, Hey, perfect. That's where we want you. Let's move forward. Where if you were to say, Hey, that was easy. We push you ahead faster. And that fine grain control isn't anywhere that I'm aware of uh, market and the ability to not have to test. That's something we're pretty strong on is the ramp test is a progressive test where you go until you can't go anymore. There's other tests where we have this too. And we previously had this where you just go all out for 20 minutes. You go out for five minutes or out for one minute. And we, you try to get the average of that, do a percentage of it. And we say, that's where your zone would be. The problem with that is you have to know in order to get an accurate test result, you have to have a consistent average. You can't start really hard than fail or then fade. And you can't start out easy, then get stronger. You have to have a really sustained level power output. And in order to do that, you have to know what your result would be before you took it. So why even take it, right? And most people don't do that. It's, it's kind of like, it's a really hard skill to know. And then you come back and you're like, well, maybe I could have done five more Watts. The other thing about our system that's cool is even if you don't perform the best on the ramp test and you had a bad day, 
after one or two workouts, our system will detect that you're having an easier time and will ramp you up quicker and put you in the correct spot. And there's even, this isn't built in the product yet. We have a project for it and we have some guidance on our podcast about it, but we want to eliminate the ability for testing because pretty much if you're doing these intervals and you keep going stronger and you're, you're, you're getting stronger, we can just kind of adjust your FTP, slide everything appropriately for your workouts. So that everything is still progressive and you're moving forward. As long as you don't take, you know, three weeks, four weeks, um, two months off training, then we're going to need a benchmark to get you going again. Yeah, it's it's awesome to hear you explain it and even dig around, poke around on the website, listen to some of the videos that you've done on your YouTube channel and podcast. And all of that, right, is oriented around, you know, it's, you guys, you nerd out on it, right? It's all super oh, scientific, so, yeah. performance-based and the the messaging both on the the website and again, across social is getting faster and, and kind of catering to this a more competitive minded person who is setting these goals and working at them over time. How do you think about that as like it relates to the overall market is the intention to say, we're going to be out there on the high performance, high output, really cater to somebody who wants to get better and faster, or is there room for to, to, to cater to a a casual, maybe exerciser or cyclist? How do you think about that market and who that target customer is? Yeah. And there's, there's two different things you said there. There is the highly competitive, like pro, but then there's the person who just wants to get better. And that person could be, they could have never ridden a bike before. I kind of think of it as the, the, someone who, um, they have grit, they want to use science to get faster and they're determined. If they have those sorts of things, that's like our customer. I think we overlap really well with CrossFit. Those people like, there's some people who just ride a bike and never want to do an interval in their life, right. For fun. Those aren't our people, but there are also people like CrossFit people who've never ridden a bike. If they come into the market, I think that we should be the right choice for them. So there's that, but there's also people, and I've been this way too, where doing a structured training plan is daunting. You have life stuff. You don't want to commit to, you know, this many day a week plan. And what we have for that is a product called train now, which is the idea is this, you just open the app, you get three workout choices, endurance ride, a climbing ride and attacking ride. You choose the duration you want to go and you just go. So you don't have to follow a training plan, but it has that same adaptive training back end. And we're switching those workouts based on what your performance is. So it's kind of, it's kind of like doing a training plan without doing it or having the commitment of like, have to follow into calendar. You just kind of say, Hey, today I want to do a 30 minute workout. So you jump on and you do it. Or this other day I have more time and I want to do an hour. You can do that too. But all again, I think the CrossFit comparison, that's really interesting to think about oriented around getting better. You know why you're doing something. You're not just showing up and kind of going through the motions. You're, it, it, it both keeps you engaged, but keeps you pushing to want to achieve more. So I, that definitely resonates with me. And I think it's an interesting take again on, because right now it, so much of it, it almost feels like table stakes, right? The, you, you start to get, hey, how are we using AI to inform this training plan? Or how do we integrate it and make it more? Oftentimes people talk about personalization but it's, it's not truly personalized. It's, it's a lot of different preferences. It's a lot of different choice among individuals. Do I like this type of training more, right? Maybe a steady state ride versus an interval ride versus so many other platforms, right? Have instructors or music that go along with it. What do I like more where you get back to something like CrossFit or somebody who's competitive in cycling or just wants to get better. You need to show them, Hey, how do we continue to do this over time? Yes. It's really the, it's showing them results, right? That you can see the, the secret about the secret sauce is it's the power meter. So with the power meter, you can measure exactly how strong you are. And when you can do something an interval for five more Watts, you can actually feel it out in the road. And it's when you're riding with your friends by yourself or in a race, that's going to be performance improvement. And that's what we focus on. And then what we say is you can layer on other entertainment on top of that music, you could do uh, one of our competitors. You could do Zwift while you do Trainer Road. Uh, people watch movies and TV if it's like an easy ride. We have a group workout feature. We can work on other people. But that's kind of, we focus on just making you faster. And then entertainment, there's so many choices in the world, right? Like the entertainment industry is huge. We don't think that we're going to do it better than everybody else. So we have led it to let everyone else just choose their own entertainment of what motivates them on that day. Yeah, that that focus is also important when you think about where you can add the most value uh, for users over time. Uh, to this point, we've we've mentioned a couple of times, right? E- like 
hooking up to the trainer and power meter, using a bike computer when you are outdoors, potentially entertainment when it comes to different content that people may choose to use in that both on the fitness side and in this kind of endurance tech side, you've seen this, the bundling of hardware, software, content, entertainment with folks, of course, like a Peloton, which is more exercise focused. You mentioned Zwift, who's working on hardware and at some point said to be launching, but also somebody like Wahoo, who acquired Sufferfest and launched their own kind of vertically integrated bundle. How do you think about the, the options that exist, right? That ecosystem that's developing and being the kind of software provider versus being vertically integrated. Yeah, it's, there are plenty of other solo harbor manufacturers where I think there's always going to be a market where it'll be open and people can plug into things. And if you're vertically integrated, there is probably, I'm sure this is what everyone's thinking of of the other companies, some way to integrate the hardware, right? With the feature, kind of like Peloton does. And that can be compelling but also it is the niche that you're going after. So we are in this interesting spot of the casual market is bigger than the market of people who really want to get faster and improve their performance, right? And we don't have investment. We are so focused on that market and it's not huge. And I think we have such a head start in everybody that it doesn't make sense for these companies to come in and go after us inside of a market that's not as big. If I were Wahoo or Zwift, I'd, be, I'd go after Peloton right? What are they, 30 billion, right? That's the, that's the move that their investors probably, I'm guessing, want to go. So for us, what we can do is kind of fun is go really overserve our community and be amazingly good at getting this AI to get people a lot faster, not focus on hardware. Cause that's, I mean, there's not many companies in the world that do hardware and software. Well, there's like Apple, Tesla. I can't think of many others, right? Right. <laughs> Not Google, Microsoft doesn't really do it. Google doesn't really do it. It can be a big bite to chew. It's usually companies are either one or the other. And I think we're a software company and that's what we focus on is doing that. And if anyone wants to license our stuff, you know, you know how to find me, but that's the strategy for us is to just be a software company and nail that core. And with, as you probably know, with ML and the amount of data that we get, we have 116 million workouts and we get this subjective data that people answer as they're doing workouts. We have this huge head start on everybody that, and as we go, it gets better and we can refine workouts even better. And then that makes us even more head start, right? Uh, our advantage on that is, um, it's cool. It took us three years to build adaptive training. We just had a retrospective the other day and we're thinking like how long ago it was. I was actually coding part of it. That's how long it was. I know that was a, maybe it was more than three years now, but anyways, I'm just saying that I like what the position we're in. And we're just going to try to work and make this system better and better and better, get more inputs in it until we are the pinnacle of training for cycling. Yeah. You, you mentioned it a couple of times, you know, the company's bootstrapped. You've been working at it for quite a while. Even this product has been three plus years in the making to get to this point. How big is the team kind of headcount or any other metric that you would feel comfortable sharing to quantify, you know, how big you are, maybe where you aspire to be? Yeah, we've always been profitable. Uh, we have 95 employees around the world. We're still growing. And uh, like I said, we had 116 million workouts in our system. Yeah, and I kind of mentioned it because as you think about it, it's obviously super compelling both for potential acquirers and for investors when you see companies like a Zwift or a Strava, hundreds of millions of dollar funding rounds, you being bootstrapped, thinking about hey, how do we both, not that you're competing directly with them, you just kind of went through the process of how you think you can differentiate, but how do you even see maybe consolidation in the space playing out? You said, hey, if you, if you want to license, you know what you're doing, adapt to training, like get in touch. But obviously both from the interest of and demand from consumers, but also the willingness of investors to come into this space, it seems like it's trending to that direction. Do you think or talk about that with the team? And what does that mean in terms of strategic planning as you continue to chart the course forward? Yeah. So we, we build the company for long-term, like we have a very long-term vision and we go towards that. And there's, we are not building the company for acquisition or anything like that. It's a profitable long-term company. And if something were to happen, you know, that would be fine and whatever, but it's not the goal. So what that does is allows us to take these big swings, like adaptive training, 
where if we're a VC company, like they're like three, three years to build this thing. And a lot of it was ML work that you can't just go faster with. You can't put 10 ML, ML engineers on the same problem and expect it to go that much faster. So that's where we're, where we're going. I mean, if other stuff happens, that's fine. But also too, we're, I think the, the interesting thing about trainer road is it's not very likely that these companies are going to do what we do better because it's not that big of a market, but our stuff could be plugged on to a big company. And then that would then uh, augment their stuff without them having to have years of investment and years of data that they don't have in years of like survey responses from athletes to be able to figure out how this whole system works together. I think that's the, the interesting part, but we, again, we're not trying to, to do that. And if it happens, it happens, but if not, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and continue making cyclists faster. Yeah. I think it's points well taken. Like none of that matters if you don't achieve and continue to maintain the high quality that you set out to do and provide value for users. So you have to stay focused on doing that and everything else will kind of take care of itself, you know, in doing that and thinking about making sure that you are continuing to provide that value. It's super impressive that you have carved out this niche within the broader cycling triathlon endurance community. What is it that you're doing from a customer acquisition standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, anything around uh, appealing to these users, or is it purely, Hey, we're the only ones doing this. We're doing it super well. And naturally they're kind of gravitating towards you. Yeah, this, I talked to my business friends about this who have SaaS companies and it's our greatest strength, but also our greatest weakness is that we really grow by word of mouth. We do marketing things. Our podcast is a, is our best marketing thing that we have where we, it's called ask a cycling coach and people send in questions. We answer them. But other than that, like we've never unlocked the ad, like the, the CAC to LTV ad ratio, or, or we do for very short periods of time. It doesn't scale up very big. So the vast majority of our growth has just been athletes use it. They like it. They tell their friend, our NPS uh, floats between like 82 and 78. So that's very high for a company and that's really good. But what you can't do now is I, I don't know how to accelerate marketing growth by doing ads or accelerate business growth. It just kind of grows by itself and it's a positive and negative, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely a good problem to have you. So many different people come at it from different angles, right? Where it's brand centric or community centric or even just dumping boatloads of money into it and hoping that they can find that conversion from the, you know, talking about the cyclists and folks who are focused on performance. Have you found kind of the inroad there, whether you think about it as building community and engaging with them and their input and forming the product or helping spread that word via word of mouth, are you tapping into anything on that community side or kind of the elite side that has been beneficial? Yeah. So we have a, we have a forum that I think it's like 3 million views a month or something like that. That's pretty good for that. But honestly, like our biggest, our biggest problem is brand recognition. Like Zwift is an example. They have amazing brand recognition. I mean, any cyclist, they're like, oh, it's you heard of Zwift. I'm like, yes, but they spent a lot of money for that. Right. They've raised $650 million. I talked to a cyclist and I think we're still probably five out of a hundred know who we are. And we're moving forward, but the, there's a huge market of people that haven't heard of us yet. And what's nice is Zwift has made it where lots of cyclists own a trainer now, right? They bought it for it. And I think out of those people, if we can let them know that this is something you can use and you can use it with Zwift or separately. And if you have that kind of fire inside where you want to measure yourself and get faster and improve yourself, hey, trainer road's right for you. So it's nice. It's, it's a blessing and a curse to have a a big player in the market that has, has grown it because they suck a lot of air out, but they've also made the pie so much bigger, right? And there's a lot of opportunity for us. Yeah, this, as we get towards the end of the conversation here, one of the parts I wanted to touch on was when you look at a lot of different companies, even as big as Strava, Wahoo, um, yourselves, some of the other kind of personalized training platforms, they've been around for a decade and in many ways were early kind of before the technology was there before the consumer base was ad adopting them kind of at scale. When you set out to build the company with, did you have this in mind? What are you surprised by the growth of this kind of endurance tech and how the market has taken to it? What was your thinking then yeah. versus like how things have played out? Yeah, that's funny. Cause when I, when we started, there's this thing called the ant USB stick. I didn't even know it was 
available. You plug it in your computer and that's how you connect stuff. And I, when I found that out, I was like, oh my gosh, this could actually work. But my goal was to have, we, it was $10 a month. And I was like, if we have 5,000 users, I would get $50,000 a month. And I would be the only employee and I could retire on that for the rest of my life. And that's it. I'd be a one person shop and just go. And now obviously the market is huge, right? With Wahoo and, and, and uh, Zwift and stuff doing things. I, though my vision, there's still things that we are launching that are like my vision from my, like the first year that we wanted to do. I uh, I'll look back in like my Apple notes and I'll have screens drawn. I'm like, Hey, this screen looks like this screen that we built for adaptive training. And that feels really cool. And there's more vision on top of that. So I did want to go there. I just, it's, I mean, as probably everyone in software knows, it takes longer than you think it does. And there's, there was a lot of pieces in order to build on that foundation in order to make those things happen. Yeah. It, looking at that kind of where things are trending, right. And the interest in the space, uh, whether it's related to what you have in store for trainer road or just in general things that you're looking at and are super interested in or excited about um, what are you keeping tabs on and and again yeah just what are you most excited about as it relates to the, the broader industry and just the opportunity that has come to present itself yeah i think one thing i mean i'm not gonna i can't share the whole vision yeah. but one thing that i'm very excited about are the amount of inputs that are available from different companies and like an open source so like sleep data hrv data menstrual cycle data, uh, weight data. There might be some like pulse ox data. There's, there's so many things that can come in that we can then feed into the system along with performance in order to like, if you had, oh, step data. So if you had a bad night's sleep the night before, well, that's probably going to affect your training today, right? And your plan should adjust. If you normally do 2000 steps a day, but you had a 10,000 step day, the plan should adjust too. And we can look at your HR, you know, is there a correlation between performance and HRV and where you measure the HRV? And there's so many things that data scientists, ML, and the data we have, because we have that very specific performance data that a lot of other companies don't have with structured intervals and we're pushing people and stuff. Combine that with some other data. I think that's going to unlock so many other fine-tuned things to really accelerate how fit people can be. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think when you look across just wearable technology, sensors, internet of things, connectivity in general. We've kind of been at this point for so many years where it's like, what do we do with all this information? Like, how do we make this work right. together so that it's not sitting in these siloed or fragmented companies or, you know, the cloud somewhere where a company like Trainer Road or lots of different players could unlock this for whatever the use case may be. I think we are now starting to get to a point where that is possible and we'll, we'll see it more and more. Yeah, but it's very early innings in that. And this approach can be used in different, you know, different sports, PT, anything, right? That if you have the inputs and you can measure the output, you'd be able to adjust it. And that's, that's another, I've mentioned this on our own podcast, but a long-term vision is to go outside of cycling and have the same kind of aspect of measure performance and adapt your training based with AI and what's specific for you. In, in different things, uh, running, weight training, lots of other other sports too. Yeah, maybe maybe one more question before you get out of here that, that kind of off script for me, it, it's come up a little bit in talking with folks that are more kind of performance oriented or founders who are building companies down that path. Do you think that we're losing anything in terms of just gut feeling or like listening to your body, right? By going so yes. much down the adaptive or wearable or data route. Like, how do you reconcile those things? Yeah. Yeah. So you totally need to listen to your body. And actually we've built that in our product where if on a day we have this thing called workout alternatives and you know, you wake up and for some reason it's not good that day, but all your metrics are right. Right. But your body feels bad. And we have the ability to make that an easier workout, which is like like the same type of workout. So maybe you're doing over-unders, but we'll step you back two weeks. It's kind of like de a deload week or something like that. And then your plan will adjust from that. And so we put that in on purpose because it is a machine plus person system that we built, not just a machine. It's It reminds me of uh, that office episode where like the GPS makes them go into the river or the lake and they have to follow it. And it's like, nope, it says we have to go this way. So I'm just going to like literally kill ourselves because that's what the system says. But you don't want that you need the human input because there's it's 
it's just, you're an athlete, right? You know, like you, you got to listen to your body inside of it. And two, if you end a workout early, which sometimes you do because you listen to your body, that's fine. But your plan should adjust in the future, right? We should know the reason why you ended and then adjust after that. If it's training fatigue, that's a different reason than if you didn't sleep well, and it's a different reason if it was too intense. All have different outcomes in our system. Yeah, it makes total sense. I think it's important and something that sometimes is left out of the conversation, right? So that that point, make sure we, we drill at home there. Talked about quite a lot today. You mentioned, you know, maybe not being able to reveal the full vision and everything that you, you're still working towards and have in store. But as you now we look ahead and get into 2022, are there any key priorities or benchmarks that you're kind of have the flag and say, you know, this is what we're, we're working towards, at least in the near term that, that you're able to share right at this point. Yeah. There's three exciting ones in terms of adaptive training. One is this is an internal beta soon to be external beta is FTP prediction. So based on your calendar, FTP is like how fit you are as a cyclist. Based on the workouts in your calendar, your training plan, we can predict at intervals up to six months with a pretty accurate certainty of what your FTP will be if you follow this training plan. That's very, very interesting for cyclists. And as far as I know, no one's done it at scale like this that we've done. The uh, next one is quantifying unstructured outside workouts or outside rides. So if you do a, a work, if you do a race or you just do a ride with your friends, right now we have the, some general metrics of the ride. It's called NP, our normalized power and TSS. But you don't get a specific of like, how much of VO2 max did you do? How much threshold? And how should we change your training plan in those energy systems based on those outside workouts or outside rides. We have that again, internal beta, and that's going to be a huge unlocking point because we'll have a full picture of your performance. And if you do a hard group ride on Sunday, well, Monday, you probably shouldn't do VO2 max intervals. And then also maybe on that Tuesday when you recovered, maybe they should be a little bit harder because you nailed, you did a, a whole bunch of VO2 max intervals inside of that group ride that you weren't aware of just the nature of the ride. And so that's kind of the ability, especially for outside that you mentioned, Joe, is that you do in the summer, someone might do a workout, but then they might ride with their friends. And we want that then to feed back into the system and change the levels and how well you, you perform in each one of those energy systems. Yeah. A lot to look forward to and super, super exciting down that path of unlocking this even more performance and insights and data that can help you go faster. As you say, yeah, wrapping up, we'll actually get you out of here on this for folks that are interested, enjoyed what we're talking about here today, want to learn more. Where can we point them? Yeah. Trainer Road, www.trainerroad.com. Easy enough. I hope folks check you out there and I'm, I'm certainly grateful that you made some time to chat today. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.